next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. It's Tuesday, and we have on our uh, Newsmaker Live line Dr. Gary Ostra, a longtime history professor at Alfred University. Dr. Ostra, thanks for calling in. Well, uh, pleasure to be here. Now, you're calling in uh, from uh, Olean uh, this morning, Dr. Ostrar, where you also do uh, Omnidsbun. Did I say that right, work? Well, that's, that's close. Uh, ombuds work. Uh, uh, the word ombuds means kind of a mediator, a problem solver, conflict resolution guy. Uh, and I do that at both Alfred University as well as at St. Bonaventure. I've been doing it here at St. Bonaventure for about 11 years and at Alfred University for about 16 years. So, you know, it's really a matter of trying to make sure that small problems don't become federal cases, that small problems don't develop into law cases or, uh, you know, really tie everybody up. Uh, Kind of off the topic, but do you ever do roommate disputes? I can't say that I have. Uh, For the most part, I deal with, well, some disputes between uh, faculty and students, sometimes between faculty and uh, other faculty, sometimes between department chairs and uh, and faculty or uh, faculty and administrators and so forth. Uh, And I also do a lot of work in respect to uh, the subject of academic dishonesty. I try to resolve some of those disputes and uh, head up an appeals committee that we have, certainly at Alfred University, so that if a student is is uh, accused of academic dishonesty and claims that uh, he or she is uh, you know, innocent of the charge. Uh, the student has the right to appeal, and that's where I get involved. Kind of curious, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the uh, essence of the questions, uh, the current events, and then this day in history, but I, I'm kind of curious. Do students today, and I don't mean to pick on the kids of today, I never liked that when that happened to uh, uh, us when I was younger, but do they have a hard time understanding the problem of plagiarism in a in an era where it's very common to copy and paste, and not necessarily copy and paste from computers in a dishonest way, but do they have a hard time seeing that issue? No, they don't have a hard time seeing it. Uh, I don't know that there's any less plagiarism than there was 30 years ago or 40 years ago. By the same token, I really don't know that there's any more. Uh, The one area where I think you're onto something is that uh, it's easier to plagiarize. Uh, You can, you know, simply go to Google, uh, go to Wikipedia, something along those lines, uh, paste something out of the, uh, let's say, a Wikipedia article and place it into your own paper. On the other hand, once upon a time and not very long ago, uh, I was involved with a case where the student had not only done that, in other words, essentially claimed that the Wikipedia material was his own and the student had not given credit to Wikipedia. Had he done that, uh, he would not have been accused of plagiarism. In other words, he argued that, you know, this is his own work. But what I found kind of amusing was that uh, he took the Wikipedia article and placed it into his paper, into his research paper, and he used the same font as Wikipedia instead Uh of using the same font as the rest of his paper. Uh-huh. So <laughs> it was kind of easy to understand that this kid didn't have a leg to stand on. We're talking to Dr. Gary Astro. We have some interesting topics on the uh, This Day in History, the beginning of World War II, September 1st, and Victory Over Japan Day, which was yesterday. We're going to get to both of those when we get to This Day in History. But let's start out with um, current events, Dr. Astro. Where would you like to go there? Well, I wanted to make a comment about something that our president said in respect to the G7 conference. Uh, He claimed that, uh, as he was about to leave, that he was in uh, communication with with telephone calls and other of his administration in communication by telephone with Chinese officials. It turns out that there were no telephone calls to Chinese officials. The president had, uh, as is often the case, simply not told the truth. And the reason he did it, claimed one of his own officials off the record, was that he was trying to, to manipulate the markets, the stock market. The president, I don't think, really understands that much about economics. He does understand uh, the stock market. And I think he tends to equate the health of our economy with the stock market. If the stock market is up, 
the president assumes that the economy is doing very, very well. That's often the case, but it's often not the case as well. In either case, he wanted to uh, assure the markets that uh, you know there may be some progress on this whole tariff war with the Chinese, and therefore he made these statements. But what he said was flatly untrue. And I found out not only that you know he was making this uh, case, that he was saying things that were untrue, but when Stuart Varney, who is a business uh, correspondent for Fox, uh, uh, for Fox TV, was asked about this, he claimed that the president had not lied, even though it was absolutely clear, crystal clear, that the president had, had in fact lied about this. And I think that that tells you something about, if you will, uh, uh, the, the, the president's propaganda machine, which includes not only White House officials, ultimately, but also, uh, uh, you know, some people in the broadcast networks. Ultimately, a democracy cannot survive without truth. That is to say, uh, it depends on getting real news from the, uh, uh, from the government. And we're not getting that right now, certainly not out of the White House. The president claims that those who tell the truth are, in fact, uh, giving us fake news. But the fake news is coming from the White House. It's not coming from the broadcast networks like NBC, CBS, ABC, MSNBC, and so forth. And uh, we're going to have to deal with that as we you know, head into the election of 2020. Do you know who it was, Dr. Ostrar, who uh, contradicted the president uh, about the phone calls to China? No, you mean uh, uh, when White House officials uh, offer that kind of information, they usually do it off the record. So we're probably not going to know. And I might add, by the way, that about one year ago, I think it was almost exactly a year ago, uh, a White House official had written a letter uh, that was eventual. It wasn't really a letter. It was a column that appeared in the New York Times, an op-ed, uh, in which he uh, complained about the disarray in the White House, about the uh, issue of, uh, of, of, of honesty and integrity and so forth. We do not know to this day who wrote that op-ed. And apparently, and I'm guessing, that that guy, whoever it is, uh, is still working in the White House. But, you know, we don't know who it is, so I'm not sure whether he's there or not. It's kind of interesting. The uh, president has... Uh been very critical of uh, Fox News as of lately. Um, he's got critics over there. Oh, Shepard Smith, uh, uh, Neil Cavuto on the Fox Business Channel. Uh, there are others. Um, usually they're uh, uh, reporters, uh, although like a, the, the two are anchors, the two names I just mentioned, Neil Cavuto on Fox Business and uh, Shepard Smith, who's on uh, Middays on the Fox News Channel. Now, it's kind of interesting because people who dislike Fox saying that it's uh, all conservative, that's not exactly the case. Uh, and Fox News defends itself saying that uh, they have a variety of views on there. The, uh, the most popular ones that you see at night, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, uh, are in the president's corner. And I think a lot of people think that because of that, Probably the, the, the Hannity and uh, Tucker Carlson clips get played on other networks and they think, oh, everything is like that. But it's not quite the case. Well, I would agree with you. I mean, there are some reporters at Fox. Uh, Chris Wallace is certainly one. Yeah, he's Shepard another Smith, one. Uh, Brett Baer. I think these guys are serious reporters. Uh, they tend to lean, if you will, to the right. But, you know, uh, leaning to the right, leaning to the left is not really an issue. The issue is truth. The issue is telling things, if you will, that are, in fact, accurate, offering an accurate story. The president said of Fox News, quote, that it isn't working for us anymore. And the reason why he said that is because Fox News had interviewed a former official in the Obama administration, and the president complained that uh, she wasn't pressed hard enough by uh, whoever it was. I don't know who was interviewing her, but you know, whoever that person was. Uh, what Neil Cavuto said is that, look, Mr. President, uh, you know, our job is not to uh, defend you. Our, our job is not to, quote, work for you. And uh, I believe it was uh, Cavuto said that, and I think it was Brett, Brett Hume also made the same point. On the other hand, uh, if you watch Fox and Friends, it's a propaganda outfit for the president. If you listen to uh, you know, Tucker Carlson, of course, and uh, some of the others that you mentioned, of course, Sean Hannity, maybe most importantly, uh, yeah, 
uh, that's uh, that's White House propaganda. Uh, that's not real news, and I think that uh, that's not helping uh, the the cause, if you will, uh, the health of of, of American democracy. Uh, I, let me mention one other thing, if I may, and that is that you know uh, some of the president's critics have lately said that he's increasingly erratic. Uh, that maybe, you know, he's worried about, more worried and more worried about the election coming up in 2020, and that that's causing him to be uh, more impulsive, uh, somewhat more erratic than he has been in the past. Is there evidence for this? And I think the answer is, yeah, I think there is some evidence for that. Uh, his comment the other day that he is the, quote, chosen one, his comment about Jews who are, are disloyal if they don't support the Republican Party. Uh, he said as recently as yesterday that uh, Hurricane Dorian will hit Alabama. And the, uh, uh, the, the Weather uh, Bureau said, no, it's not going to hit uh, Alabama. And the president came back and said that, yes, indeed, it is going to hit Alabama. That's kind of weird, and I don't know what to make out of that. He's, he's argued that we should, you know, fairly recently consider uh, nuking the hurricanes, in other words, dropping nuclear bombs uh, in, the, in, the, in the hurricane's eye. And when he apparently said this at a cabinet meeting or at some other meeting of his advisors, there was, as it was reported, stunned silence. No one knew what to say. Uh, uh, you know, his idea certainly does not have a lot of scientific uh, uh, validity. Uh, the president has recently said that he would pardon any of the officials who would break the law in order to build his wall down between Texas and Mexico. Uh, that's, I, I don't know what, what you would call that other than, uh, uh, you know, playing around, essentially reducing the importance of, uh, of law itself. He suggested that his Florida properties should become the site of the next G7 meeting. Uh, that's using the president for his own personal gain, which is unconstitutional. There's a constitutional pro prohibition against exactly that. Uh, he's treated recently a classified image of an Iranian missile. This is a classified issue, uh, a classified image. Had President Obama done that, the Republicans would have been calling for his impeachment. Uh, and there are a number of other things, including, of course, calling the Chinese president an enemy of the United States and, uh, uh, and his attack on uh, the president's attack on Jay Powell, Powell, who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. This we've never seen anything quite like this. OK, we're in uncharted waters and the president's supporters, 40 percent of the American public who seem to accept almost anything that he says uh, as essentially accurate or uh, you know, correct or whatever, uh, are going to have to come to terms with this because I think that, uh, you know, it places the U.S. both domestically and in respect to foreign policy in a very vulnerable position. Did you catch that uh, Rand Paul made a statement about the uh, Federal Reserve? He said the Federal Reserve likes to meddle with uh, presidential affairs, and he wants to, uh, uh, Senator Rand Paul says it's time for Congress to uh, uh, pass legislation where they audit the Federal Reserve. Well, Rand Paul has been saying that kind of thing, and I might add his father was saying that kind of thing for a long, long time. They've been enemies of the Federal Reserve. These are guys who want to go back to the old gold standard of the 19th century. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is nonsense. The Federal Reserve under Republican administrations like that of the Bushes, under Democratic administrations, certainly like the Clintons or the Obamas, the Federal Reserve has been remarkably independent and remarkably nonpartisan. And every president on occasion is going to criticize the Federal Reserve. I think the Federal Reserve has done a remarkably good job of stabilizing our currency system, of stabilizing our economy generally. And that's not to say that, you know, we haven't had a Great Depression. Obviously, we had a real shock in 2008. The Federal Reserve has done what it could. Uh, it's not perfect. But by the same token, I think that one ought to preserve the independence of that organization. Dr. Ostrar, on the topic of Brexit, uh, reading the headlines uh, online this morning from the BBC, Brexit, Boris Johnson faces showdown in Parliament. From NBC, Boris Johnson faces a Brexit showdown. Pretty much the same headline. From CNN, Britain's crazy Brexit crisis is about to get crazier. What do you make of it? 
Well, the, uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is not only arguing in favor of a no-deal Brexit, which really may topple the British economy. Right now, we already see the British pound. I don't want to say it's collapsing, but it's at the lowest point against the dollar in years and years. Uh, uh, you know, he's out, you know, he's made this a campaign issue. I think he is going to do it. Uh, he is arguing that, uh, uh, you know, as we get closer to the deadline, which if I'm not mistaken is October 31st, uh, that, uh, the European Union will cave in and will make a deal with him. Uh, that may or may not be the case. I don't know whether the European Union is about to, uh, uh, you know, weaken on this whole subject or not. But what I do know is that, and I think we all know at this point, uh, that he has said that uh, uh, that uh, president that uh, prime minister johnson has said that he has asked the queen to suspend parliament this is the first time this has been done this is for a, you know for, for a full month this is the first time that this has been done since the 17th century and when it was done in the 17th century it eventually led to a civil war in england this is pretty serious stuff does he have the authority to do it the answer is yes he does uh, is it wise to do it? I think the answer is uh, certainly, certainly not. But it does put the opposition in a very, very difficult position because the opposition is led by Jeremy Corbyn. He's a socialist. Uh, he's, of course, the, uh, you know, the head of the Labor Party. He is not particularly popular. If elections are called, I don't think it's at all clear that the uh, opposition is going to win the election. Nevertheless, a number of Labor Party members and also members of, uh, of, the, of the Conservative Party, of Johnson's own party, uh, have said that they are going to vote for a, uh, if you will, they're going to vote against a no-deal Brexit. They're going to try to tie the hands of the prime minister. And if they do that, it may lead to a vote of no confidence. And if that happens, there will indeed be new elections uh, in Great Britain. And I don't know how those elections are going to turn out. We're talking to uh, Dr. Gary Ostrar. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment, and we will get to uh, this day in history with Dr. Ostrar. Stay with us. Are you more than $10,000 in debt? Feel like you're on a never-ending treadmill, staying in one place and never getting ahead with those minimum payments? Don't let the credit card companies bully you anymore. There are programs in place to help you get free of your debt, and you don't have to pay the entire amount you owe. The program at Total Financial Freedom can help you get debt-free in months instead of decades. Call Total Financial now at 800-899-8922. That's 800-899-8922. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carroll. Hey, Rob, what's the latest on uh, Dorian? Well, it is stationary north of Grand Bahama Island this morning. Brian, it is not moving at all. It's sitting uh, just uh, about 35 miles northeast of Freeport in on Grand Bahama Island. Uh, half the island has been inundated by the Atlantic. Uh, it's going to continue to punish that island for seven more hours with the southern eye wall. That should start to move away later today. It looks like it's going to remain just far enough offshore that the strongest winds will remain east of the Florida coast. That should also hold true Wednesday night east of the Georgia coast. If it's going to make landfall anywhere in the continental United States, it looks like maybe Cape Hatteras some point Thursday before the system passes off to the south and east of the northeastern part of the country Friday. So the good news is no direct effects on the northeast from Dorian. In fact, we've got a decent day shaping up for today. We have high pressure and control. We're going to see it turn mostly sunny for a while this morning once the low cloudiness is gone. Then we're partly sunny this afternoon ahead of a cold front. It should be near 75. Clouds are going to be with us tonight. There will be a few showers after midnight with the front 60 to 65. Front moves through tomorrow. The showers and thunderstorms end in the afternoon. We're breezy 70 to 75. Partly cloudy and much cooler behind the front tomorrow night, 45 to 50. Sunshine and quite fall like Thursday, Brian. High temperatures only 65 to 70 with abundant sun. Back with Dr. Gary Ostrow. Now on to this day in history, September 1st. Uh, Sunday was the anniversary of the beginning of World War II, Dr. Ostrow. 80 years ago exactly, uh, the uh, German army, uh, Hitler's army, invaded Poland. Uh, they concocted a story about a Polish attack on a German post office on the German side of the Polish-German border. Uh, in fact, of course, there was no attack at all. Hitler used this as an excuse to, uh, to attack Poland. The war did not last very long there. In approximately two to three weeks, 
the Polish army had been defeated. Uh, the Polish army was a lot uh, it was a lot smaller than the German army. The Polish air fort air, air force was fitted with uh, really many planes, which by 1939 were rather obsolete. And so, yeah, the war was on. Uh, and when the Germans did occupy Poland, what they did is they made an agreement with the Soviets. And the Soviets would occupy about 40% of the eastern section of Poland. The Germans would occupy about, the well, the other 60% of Poland. And it was a disaster for the Polish public. First of all, it allowed Hitler to round up literally 3 million uh, uh, so uh, uh, P- Polish Jews, uh, and they were eventually the vast, vast majority of them were eventually killed either by what's called Einsatzgruppen, in other words, simply German uh, machine gun units, or else they were sent to places like Auschwitz and Treblinka. Another three million Poles were killed by the Germans. These are non-Jewish uh, Poles, Catholic Poles. It included many members of the uh, intelligentsia, that is to say, uh, newspaper editors, priests, uh, teachers, mayors of village officials, and uh, all, you know, all over Poland and whatnot. It was a real catastrophe uh, for the Poles. The Germans wanted that area to be cleared of Slavs, to be cleared of the Poles, so that Germans could move into that area. That was on September 1st that war started. Two days later, on September 3rd, that would be today, uh, the British and the French declared war on Germany. And from that point on, this, you know, World War II was on. But it's kind of interesting because from September 3rd until about uh, March of 1940, in other words, for approximately six months or so, it was not much of a war. They called it the phony war. There were a few air raids. There were a few clashes here and there. But for the most part, there was very little actual fighting. And then in March of 1940, the Germans, Hitler ordered his uh, troops to invade uh, 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 first Denmark. They occupied Denmark, uh, then Norway, so that he would have kind of control of the northern reaches toward, uh, toward the Soviet Union. Uh, and then uh, by May, on May 10th to be exact, he ordered his troops to attack France. So that lasted about six weeks. And so in a relatively short period of time, the war appeared to be going very, very well for the Germans, uh, had a lot of support at home. It did not initially in September of 1939, but it certainly did by May and June of 1940. What Hitler had not counted on was that eventually, and he's going to make two huge, huge mistakes during World War II, he would invade the Soviet Union. He assumed it would be over quickly. It was not, obviously. Ninety percent of all German soldiers who died during World War II were going to die on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. And then he even and makes a uh, uh, you know an equally foolish uh, 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 decision uh, to declare war on the United States after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. Doctor Oster, our final question on that: um, Which army lost the most soldiers in World War II? Far and away, the Russian army. Uh, the Russians would lose. Now, I'm, you know, I'm saying Russian army, but this is also Russian civilians. We don't know the exact numbers, but the Russians lost somewhere between 20 million and 27 million people. The United States lost 410,000 of its men. Remember, the United States was never actually invaded. The only way in which uh, this country was literally touched by the war, that is our territory, was in Hawaii itself, and of course Wake Island, and then in the Aleutians in in, in Alaska, the Aleutian Islands. Uh, So, you know, our losses were much, much lower. Uh, The French lost in the neighborhood of around 150 or 200,000 men. The British lost... uh, uh, you know, I don't remember the exact number, but probably in the neighborhood of 400,000 or so. Uh, but the great losses were on the part of the Soviets and also, of course, on the part of the Germans, who would lose ultimately in the neighborhood of four to five million of their men killed in action and many others, of course, who were wounded. Absolutely huge numbers there. Dr. Gary Ostrauer, I uh, want to thank you uh, so much for joining us. Uh, always very interesting having you on. Well, let's avoid a World War III. You said it. It's AM 1480, WLEA Horn.